my first time in Rochester. Um, and uh, I got in around 11, and then Kaylin took me to Sticky Fingers, uh, Sticky yes. Lips, Mar <laughs> and now I think I love this, this city. <laughs> uh, 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 me. Um, but I want to talk to you all a little bit today about the work we did in New York City um, to reform NYPD practices that we felt had the effect of discrimination. So this is a lot of work. It took, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of players. Um, but the New York Civil Liberties Union was lucky enough to be part of this movement from its inception. And, and Kayla is right, we met when I was working at Planned Parenthood and I actually came to the New York Civil Liberties Union to do LGBT organizing work. And after like two months, my boss looked at me and was like, you're going to work on police reform. I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, why? Because I'm black? No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> I, said, I said, you know, look, um, I've always cared about policing in New York City. I've always, you know, I've been around for years and I saw everything with Diallo and you know, or Sean Bell and all these instances of extreme police violence against communities of color uh, specifically. And I said, oh, hell yeah, I'll work on this, right? Let's, let's see what we can do. Um, so it's really exciting to have been a part of this work. And I just want to talk to you all a little bit about some of the work we, we've done. And then I want to hear like what your thoughts are. I want to answer any questions you have about the work we did. I'm sure you'll have a bunch of questions. Um, and so, I'm here. I'm here all day and tomorrow, as Kayla said. So, um, yes. So, stop and frisk. I think the easiest way for advocates to come together around police reform in New York City was around the uh, practice of stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. Different organizations have been working on police reform in New York City for years. So, you have the activists that were working specifically on police shootings, you have people that were working on building or reforming the civilian complaint review. You have people who are looking for special prosecutors, right? Those are people who um, we would, you know, um, this is a position we would insert at the statewide level to look at extreme issues of force. Um, we have people working on um, the quota system. Everybody was looking at policing from different angles, and we decided the one unifying issue at that time was stop and frisk. We had data from stop and frisk stemming from the 2003, when the city council, uh, the New York City Council, passed the law that said that the NYPD had to report um, how many stops they've done a year, who they were stopping, what, were, what was happening as, as a result of those stops, what was happening during the stops. Um, and so it's really important that we had this information. And because we had this information and people were paying attention to this information, right? When you have stats that say things like 90% of the people who are stopped are black and Latino, even though that population only makes up about 55% of the population, it's like, okay, let's pay attention to this, right? And because this was a unifying thing for all the different groups, this was easy for us to coalesce around. And so we had the data. Um, the data was terrible for the NYPD. <laughs> it was really damning for them. And, and the thing that was so interesting about the data is that it was their data. This wasn't data that we were collecting about them. This was data that they were reporting themselves. Um, and so, we, we thought about this issue and we started to come together around the idea of stopping for us. What we saw was stopping for us. What, so what the New York Civil Liberties Union is really good at doing, um, specifically in New York City, but all around the state, is highlighting the numbers and getting press around the numbers. And so year after year, we will put out the numbers that the police will report themselves around stopping for us. And year after year, they were worse and worse. So you have, in 2002, this is the first year we actually have um, any data from how many stops were made. There are around 100,000 stops. You see, in 2011, which is the height of stop and frisk, I'll, I'll be honest and say right now, some of it is as a result of our work, and some of it is just um, as a result of some of the lawsuits happening in New York City. Stops are down. This year, we're on target to make, uh, the NYPD is on target to make around 250,000 stops which is way lower than they were at the height in 2011, which was close to 700,000 stops. Mm -hmm. So we had this data, and we're like, what are we going to do with this? So every, every quarter, every year, we would put out this data, which was damning, which was sad, but no one actually knew, what do we do about this? Like, we have this data, but what does it mean? This is the thing that is interesting, and this is what a lot of our community groups and organizations that came together to create CPR sort of highlighted the most, which is the fact that 
blacks only made about 23.4 or 23% of the population, or 50, almost 54% of the stops, right? Um, whites, Native Americans, 43% of the population, only 13% of the stops. Latinos, it was a little bit more um, even, but we saw an extreme disparity when it came to race and stops. And that was something that we highlighted over and over again. So, so the interesting thing is, when you think about stops, you have, this is their data. And from their own data, they're saying, not only are we stopping tons of more people of color, there's also higher use of force um, rates with people of color. There's also, um, aside from stops, there was also, but the thing that's, that they didn't talk about, which we were able to highlight, is the fact that they actually had a higher, what we call hit rate, right? And that is the success rate, right? Whether or not there's an arrest, or a summons or a ticket um, given out during the, uh, as a result of stop with whites. They also had a higher hit rate for whites when it was about um, contraband recovery. So they were actually more successful in getting guns from a white person when they made a stop than they were from a black person, right? And this is all data we were able to highlight, right? And this started to happen, this was even before the coalition sort of came together, but all of this data started to lay the groundwork for how the coalition would, um, came together and then what we were able to do as a result of it. The interesting thing about stops though, so the police immediately responded to our stats about stops by saying, well, we go where the crime is, right? So if we're in Bed Bed Bedford-Stuyvesant, or this is like a part of central Brooklyn that's heavily black, if we're um, sent to, if we're deployed to bed Stuy, then we're gonna stop black people because that's who lives there. But what we were able to see from their data is that even in neighborhoods that were majority white, the majority of those stops were black and Latino people. Um, and so that started to bring together our coalition. Um, we had this data and we started to say, like, what are we gonna do with it now? What, what, what can we do about this? This, this data is damning, the NYPD is a little bit shameful, even though they're very brazen about these numbers. Bloomberg uh, would stand up in front of audiences say like, so? This is, <laughs> this is the numbers, and what's next? Let's talk about something else, right? We're stopping people, we're keeping crime down, we're keeping your city safe, we have to do this in order to protect your communities, and so like, next, <laughs> what are we gonna talk about? Um, I like to make a joke that every time we had a rally, it was raining, so you see like people in front of <laughs> This is one of our rallies outside of City Hall um, uh, as, uh, when we were trying to introduce legislation to reform stop and frisk. But we brought, we brought together groups, and this sort of happened um, through two, three convenings that happened, um, yeah. <laughs> three convenings that happened um, with coalition groups. So, I will be honest with you all and tell you right up front, we had two major funders decide that they wanted to fund Stop and Frisk work as a result of all the attention that was so this is not something, I, we talk about this, I talk, around, I talk about Stop and Frisk and the coalition and the movement around the country, and then as soon as I say funding, people are like, see? <laughs> I'm like, that's what y'all, right? You have all of this money to pull this together. But I think that a lot of the, the particulars around how we pulled it together and what we did was secondary, was, was sorry, was primary before the money, the money is secondary. But we did have um, Open Society Foundation and Atlantic Philanthropies put together a convening over the summer of advocates from all around the city. And so we had every type of <coughs> advocacy group you could imagine. So we were sitting around a table with um, academics. We were sitting around a table with criminologists. We were sitting around a table with lawyers and legal groups. We are working with policy wants. We are working with um, grassroots organizations, police accountability groups that were on the ground doing marches in the street um, sitting at the same table with people who are only thinking about this from an academic standpoint. So that was the thing that was really interesting about these communities. You have people who are looking at police reform from every different angle, making decisions together about how we'll address the problem. I think, for a person I've been doing organizing work for about eight years now, that, I've never seen that before in my life. That was, it was really, um, what excited me so much about this work because of all the cross-sectionality of the different groups that were involved um, from the beginning. And so you have groups sitting together thinking about what can we possibly do? What are some remedies for this behavior that's spiraling out of control, right? Because you have people saying like, 
this is important, our communities are being harassed, but you also have mainstream media um, you know, saying that this is what is necessary in order to keep our city safe. So how do we combat that? This was a huge beast that we had to deal with, and how do we do that? So first of all, um, out of the convenings, we started to form what is now Communities United for Police Reform. And so even though we had a lot of different people at that table, we realized that the table still wasn't big enough, right? We didn't, still didn't have every representation that was possible when we think about who experiences discriminatory policing. And while we all just experienced it a little slightly differently, it was the same, right? That is what unified us, that these practices affected us all, maybe slightly differently, maybe if you were um, represented in the immigrant community, it was more about the possibility of deportation from a stop. Maybe if you were in a trans community, it was more uh, about the possibility of being arrested for it, uh, you know, suspicion of prostitution. Maybe if you were in the black community, it was more about the possibility of use of force or deadly force that would be used against you. Maybe if you were in you know, a poor community, it was more about suspicion of weapons or drugs. Right? We all had a different reason why we encountered police, but the effect was always the same. Right? Our communities were being targeted. And so we brought together black and Latino communities, LGBT communities. What was really important was the, um, when a lot of the Muslim surveillance advocates, uh, advocates that were fighting Muslim surveillance, joined our coalition. I think at first we were very afraid of that. We were like, wait, this is two different fights, right? We don't want, you know, sort of that 9-11 crowd who's like, no, they need to be surveilled and we need to, you know, tackle this issue of terrorism. Maybe this is not the right move for our coalition to pull these people in. But we realized really soon, like, we're all fighting the same battle. And it's important that we unify. And when those folks came into our coalition, it just made our coalition that much stronger. Um, homeless communities. What we realized about the homeless community in New York City is that they are the front line of police abuse. They encounter police the most because they're on the street. And what we realized is over and over again, they would be charged with things like disorderly conduct or being in the park after dark. Why? Because they don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and we realized that they had experienced policing in a way that a lot of our other communities hadn't even experienced. And so it was important to pull them into the movement. At the same time, we had people saying, well, maybe we should leave that as a separate fight because you know, it would make this cause easier for us to win if we didn't have all of these undesirables in our coalition. But we said, no. Right? It is important that we are unified the best way we can be, and that is everybody who experiences discriminatory policing needs to be at this table. Um, immigrant communities, grassroots groups, clergy. It was really hard. Um, I, I, I was raised in a, a black church. My father was actually a pastor. And it was easy to get the Catholic Church to get involved in our movement. It was easy to get the Unitarian um, Universalist in our movement. It was really hard to work with some of the black churches because they were the same people who sort of Bloomberg toted at a press conference when he said, stop and frisk is saving black lives, right? So you have us saying, right, stop and frisk is harassing our communities, and then you have Bloomberg show up at a press conference with um, a black pastor who had the largest congregation in New York City saying that, no, we need this program because this is how our community stays safe. Stay safe. And it was like, oh, man, what the hell are we going to do? Um, and it took a long time for us to get clergy to actually come out and say, like, stop and frisk is bad, right? We don't want our community to harass. And it took a long time for us to explain to them how uh, ineffective but also damning the program was for the community. But it, it took some work, and we finally got them to come to the table. Researchers are easy. <laughs> Anytime you show them some data and some uh, policy report that they can write and get some not uh, notoriety about, they're like, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> we had the legal groups, which is really interesting. We had groups who were sort of fighting for turf in New York City for years, now sitting at the same exact table saying, all right, let's come up with a litigation strategy together. Like, for people, I hear, mm, Yes. <laughs> for us as advocates to see that it was so empowering to see, you know, the Center for Constitutional Rights sit down with the New York Civil Liberties Union and say, together, we're going to think about a litigation strategy. 
right now they're working together on the remedies in both the Floyd lawsuit and the Lagone lawsuit. Floyd is the Center for Constitutional Right. Lagone is the New York Civil Liberties Union um, a lawsuit, both challenging the constitutionality of stop and frisk in, in slightly different contexts, obviously. Floyd is a big case. Um, but you have us sitting down together saying, we're going to go to the city together to develop remedies. That is like unprecedented. We haven't seen that in this type of movement in a long time with people working together. Policy groups, traditional civil rights groups. The thing that's interesting about um, the traditional civil rights groups in New York City, groups like um, the NAA and uh, National Action Network, which is Al Sharpton's group for folks who don't know, um, they weren't immediately at the table. We sort of started to develop our policy plan and our agenda before they were brought to the table. Um, some of it was strategic because we wanted to make sure that we had our plan together before we went to those groups. Because in New York City, they are very powerful and they can reshape your whole agenda, right? And so we wanted to come up with an agenda that we felt represented all communities and then work with them to it, you know, amend it if they had amendments, and then use their power to push it even further. So as, as some of you probably know about the big march that happened in New York City, that march was already planned. We just sort of jumped on that march, and we gave them the policy ask of that march. We were like, you guys are doing this march. We're going to send as many people as possible. But guess what? This is what you're going to ask for from this march. You're going to tell the city, you brought out 70,000 people, and now you want them to pass this legislation, our package that we have laid out for you. That is wonderful. Um, so that was very strategic, but it was great. And then we had public defenders and law enforcement, which was very difficult. Um, the, the law enforcement that sort of joined into our movement were organizations like 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement or Latino Af Officers Association. Um, and that even took time because originally they looked at our platform and said, you can't do this. <laughs> You'll never get it done. It's a waste of time. What we should be focusing on is changing the leadership of the police department, and that's how we'll change policing in New York City. We were like, yeah, clearly it ain't that simple, right? <laughs> There's a lot of other things we'll, we'll need to do besides leadership um, to change the way our communities are policed, and so this platform is very robust for a reason. So you have all these groups now together, but what do you do with them? And so what we decided to do was sort of create five areas of work that we would the first was community empowerment. The reason why we thought about community empowerment was because you can legislate whatever you want. You can litigate this thing to the cows come home. If communities don't feel empowered to hold the police accountable for themselves, it means nothing. And so a large part of our work was about empowering the community. Um, we obviously came up with some policy reform, uh, a policy reform platform um, that focused on two pieces of legislation I talked to you a little bit today about that we actually got passed and, and a whole plethora of other things that we're still working on. Um, electoral work. We did a lot of work to register voters. Um, our main goal of, of, the tw of the mayoral election of 2013 was to make stop and frisk an issue in an election. I think we accomplished that. <laughs> um, when I think about the, the, um, uh, the speeches that both candidates made, Loda and de Blasio, after they received their party's nomination, de Blasio's last word was, and we're going to reform stop and frisk. And Loda's last words were, and we're going to keep stop and frisk just the way it is. <laughs> we're like, good, we lost. <laughs> but we were that was going to happen. Um, and then, you know, obviously litigation strategies and making sure that's coordinated. And then finally, finally we had to do a lot of public education and communications work. We actually hired a firm. Um, to, to come on and like think through talking points because while our communities were all on board, we got that policing was messed up and, and that we needed some reforms, the larger community was like, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> you know, I want to protect my property, I want to feel safe, and if this practice is making me safe, right, um, we need to keep doing this. So, legislation. So, we came up with a bunch of stuff some of which is a little bit crazy and it's going to take us maybe 20 years to get accomplished in New York City, and some of which um, happened relatively fast. And a lot of that, um, I think, is, is because of the movement and how many people are a part of it. Um, but first, we uh, created uh, legislation that would ban profiling. And I know you all are looking like, I thought it's already illegal to profile someone. Um, and it is. But in New York City, there was a law that just basically said you can't profile people. 
And that was the extent of it. And like, thanks, this is nice <laughs> with an enforcement mechanism. And so for the first time, we have a ban on profiling that also has an enforcement mechanism. It has a private right of action. So if you can prove that you've been profiled by police, you can take that to court. The other piece um, um, that's really important about that is not just intentional discrimination, but it's also unintentional discrimination. So there's a disparate impact piece to that um, legislation that says, even if you didn't mean to target certain communities, your policy has the effect of discrimination, and therefore we can challenge it. Which was really exciting for us um, as advocates. People were like, whoa, this seems exciting. <laughs> and we actually got that done. We passed that bill through the city council um, in, in 2013. Yes. <laughs> My time is all off because we've been doing so much. Um, the other bill was the, uh, to create an office of an inspector general. This would be someone that would oversee police practices, look at the programs and say, yeah, this is messed up. You can't do this anymore, right? And what you should be doing is this. Or what you should focus on is less of this and more of this, right? You, this is how you achieve the same government interest with, with less, less discrimination. And so now we have that person. And that person actually just took office this week, uh, or the beginning of last week on Tuesday after Memorial Day. And we already met with him and pre showed him, like, all the areas that we want him to investigate, which includes, you know, um, you know, the disproportionality of summonses and arrests that are made in New York City, um, ticketable offenses. We also want him to look into marijuana arrests in New York City, which is still the number one arrest in New York City. Um, we want him to look at building surveillance. There's a bunch of stuff that we gave him a list of, some of which he might take seriously, some of which he might not, but we'll stay on his back because we got him in that position. Um, and then there are a bunch of other things that we want to do that we're still working on. So at the city council level, we're still trying to pass a bill that will mandate that the police officer tell someone of their right not to consent to a search when there's not probable cause. Um, which obviously is really important because so often in our cities, people are stopped and they're told, empty out your pocket, show me what's in your pocket, and people do it because they don't know they have the right not to do it. And then that's how we have so many small arrests for marijuana or um, sometimes uh, the arrest of, especially the trans community, for possessing condoms and they use it as evidence of prostitution, right? So this, these are things that we think are really important. Uh, we also want um, to pass a bill at the city level that require the NYPD to not just identify themselves when they make a stop, but tell you the reason for the stop. I know for a lot of people that sounds like very trivial, but when we talk to communities over and over again, the thing that is so disheartening is when you hear a young person say, I have no idea why I was stopped 16 times in the last year. I'm just standing outside, I'm walking from school, I'm walking to work, and I have no idea why the police stopped me. And so they need to answer some questions. What is the reason for this stop? And then also provide some sort of, um, I guess I should call it a receipt, <laughs> Um, for the stop, where you have information about who that officer is, how you can make a complaint if you felt like you were um, mistreated, and you know just information that normally, if you ask the cop, well, what's your badge number? They know you want to make a complaint about them, and therefore you may have something like a disorderly conduct charge because they feel like you're going to make a complaint, and so now they're going to mess with you, right? And so we want to make sure that that is changed for people when just the everyday street encounters for people will be different if we were to pass this law. I'm going to speed up because I feel like I'm taking a long time. The other thing that we want to do uh, is ban arrest for non-criminal offenses. Right now, in New York City, police have full discretion about whether or not they'll arrest you for a violation. So something as simple as having a bike on the sidewalk, you can get a ticket or you can be arrested. And right now, if you what we're seeing from the numbers, if you're black or Latino in Harlem, you'll get arrested. And if you're white in Midtown, you won't. And so we want to change that and make sure that they can arrest people for things that are not a crime. Um, the other thing is to criminalizing marijuana and making it um, uh, not an arrestable offense. That's another thing that we want to change. So many arrests are still, Mar New York City is the marijuana arrest capital in the country, um, which is just not cool. Like, that's not what we should be known for. Um, <laughs> and then the final thing is um, transferring discipline authority away from the commissioner. Right now in communities, when you have police shootings, when you have um, the extreme use of force, and you have all of these things happening, 
Um, there's an investigation, things happen, and even if the police officer is found guilty, the only <coughs> person who can discipline that police officer is the police department, the commissioner. And so what we see a lot of times, even when um, you know, these claims are substantiated, right, and the officer is found to have done something wrong, nothing really happened. So we had a case of someone, an officer breaking someone's spleen and losing five days vacation. Like, that ain't right. Um, and so we want to figure out how we transfer discipline or, um, disciplinary authority from the police commissioner and give it to someone else. Who that someone is, we're still thinking about. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to that, but yeah. Um, the other thing, obviously, is community empowerment. So the first thing we did was launch 10 teams across New York City, cop watch teams. So these are teams of people who are trained to go out and film police activity. Um, they take pictures, they film it, they talk to people about their rights, and they have records of this. We also created our app that allows people to use it on a smartphone, um, because what we were finding with people is that if they were filming the police when something happened, the police would either take the phone, break the phone, erase the footage. Um, so what our app allows people to do is as soon as they close it down, it automatically gets sent to us, so it doesn't matter what happens to the phone. We'll always have that footage. And so um, it's really cool that we created that. And we just wanted to create a culture of people who monitor police activity. And what we find, especially um, in, in heavily police communities, it's a deterrent for police violence. Right? So it's a deterrent for use of force, it's a deterrent for um, unnecessary stops, and it's a really cool program. We also started a leadership development institute, and, and over the last two years, we've trained over 200 community members how to train other people about their rights with police, which is really cool. Like That's the first step in like educating communities about their rights and what they can be doing when they, have ex when they experience police encounters. Um, we're, we're doing it in the public housing units, we're doing it in schools. Um, we have so many people come and want to learn about their rights and then become trainers themselves. And the cool part about that is that we're paying them to do it, right? Because so often people don't have the time or um, they have to take off work in order to do something like that. And so we're paying them to learn and then to go out and teach other people, which we're really proud of. And then um, obviously we're doing a, 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 a public education strategy around knowing your rights. And we've done over 300 presentations to over 14,000 people across the city about their rights when they encounter police. I think I'm going to go quick now. <laughs> so uh, some of the other um, strategies, obviously electoral work. We registered thousands of new voters. Um, and we did a lot of candidate education and going to communities and telling people about especially when we were trying to pass the, the legislation at the city level, tell them about their local council member, where they stand on the issue, how they can write them, and tell them what they should be doing. We did a lot of that work. Um, the research group, which is really important, is starting to look at alternative policing strategies and practices. One thing we've been saying forever is stop, stop, and frisk, or stop, you know, exploiting stop and frisk. But the responsible thing is to, if you're telling people they shouldn't do something, what then should they be doing? Right? And so that's why we have researchers and criminologists looking at what's effective in other cities and other countries and what the NYPD can be doing instead of the practice of stop and press. Um, they're also looking at crime trends and, and mainly trying to debunk the, the myth about broken windows policing theory, which says that if you heavily police disorder, you will um, mitigate serious crime. Right? So that is their idea that if today's jaywalker is tomorrow's <laughs> rapist. Right? Or if we stop people from minor crimes, then that means there will never be serious criminals later. Which is not true, which doesn't make sense in any rational belief. But our police department, even our current um, police commissioner, believes this wholeheartedly. He's already started like uh, cracking down on the homeless community, pulling people off the trains, that are sleeping, um, uh, sleeping. Um, he's already started uh, the, the arrest of panhandlers, and even the dancers on the train. Now, I don't know how often y'all take the New York City subway. <laughs> yes, those dancers are annoying. Yes, you need to duck when they start doing the flips, but they shouldn't get arrested for that, right? <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Um, and so there, there's a lot of work that we have to do to debunk that myth around why broken windows um, is effective. And then finally, coordinating some of our litigation strategies and brainstorming new ideas. Like, how, how can we litigate this whole um, arrest of homeless communities or this crackdown on homeless communities? 
So just to talk a little bit about um, how we change public opinion around uh, stop and frisk. This was, to me, the communication strategy was the hardest work that we did. I think when you have people who believe that stop and frisk is effective and we need that practice in order to keep us safe, it is like an uphill battle to say that that is not true. And so first it was about telling our story. Over and over again, we hammered the media, we hammered at press conferences, we hammered <coughs> communities how these practices and how a stop was not just a minor inconvenience, but it was devastating to people, right? When you feel, when we have people tell stories about, you know, being stopped with babies and having their babies taken out of carriages and put on the ground in order for police to search the baby carriage to see that they don't have any kind of weapons or drugs, like, those are the stories that people needed to hear. This wasn't just a minor inconvenience of the police saying, hey, let me just check you out. Oh, you're good. Go on about your business, right? For some people, it was extremely devastating, and we needed to exploit those stories. Um, we also needed to reframe the issue. Bloomberg, you know, for a long time, we were hammering with these stories, and we're saying that this is not cool, and people are really traumatized by these stops. And Bloomberg said, this practice is saving black lives. He said it over and over and over in the media. And as a black woman, I was always offended. Like, really? You, you were saving black lives? Um, but that's interesting. Um, and so he was hammering that story away. And then we have to sort of take that narrative back. We care about public safety, too. We live in these communities that are being you know, ravaged by violence and gun violence. We care, too. You're not the only person who cares about black lives. And if you really did, you wouldn't do these practices that are destroying them. Um, and so it was about reframing the issue and taking back the word public safety. We actually named our legislation, our legislative package that we passed in the city council, the Community Safety Act, right? That was our, and then they stole it and said Criminal Safety Act, which was really funny. Um, <laughs> they got two points for that. It's interesting. <laughs> but we tried to reclaim that, that narrative that we all care about public safety. Um, then we started to talk, talk about police community relationships, right? The way that police are treating communities is breaking down trust. If people don't trust police, then police won't trust people, and it's sick, right? And now this is why people don't participate in investigations with police officers, because they don't trust you, because when you're there, you're harassing them, right? And that was uh, something that really played well um, with, with all communities when we started to talk about the breakdown of trust due to these behaviors and these practices. We also talked about stop and frisk just being ineffective, and then obviously, like the people who kind of throw our 12 points last, but it's about fairness and it's about justice, right? It's about this isn't fair and this isn't right. It's like, all right, what else do you have there? We have to come up with some other messaging. So that sort of took a back seat, but I slipped it in there here and there. Um, <laughs> this is one of the stories that we got placed in the New York, um, New York Times that always, um, it was one of the first stories that got put out, and I think it really did a lot for our movement. And um, Nicholas Pert, he's a part of one of the organizations that were a part of Communities United for Police Reform. And he said, for young people in my neighborhood, getting stopped and frisked is a rite of passage. We expect the police to jump out us, jump us at any moment. We know the rules. Don't run and don't try to explain. Because speaking up for yourself might get you arrested or worse. And we all feel the same way. Degraded, harassed, violated, and criminalized because we're black or Latino. Um, when that story hit in the New York Times, it was huge. I think that was the, one of the first times people started to realize it's not just an inconvenience. Like, people are traumatized by this behavior, and it's important that we change it. Um, yeah, I, let's just skip ahead because I'm going to move on. So one of the things that we did, which was really important, was that we started to debunk, debunk the myth about stop and frisk effect. So the first thing that she's saying is, stop and frisk getting done with the street. And so we have this really fancy data policy, data and policy analyst in our office, and we said, tell us that this is not true. <laughs> Figure out why he's lying. We know he's lying, but we need um, facts, we need hard data. And what this shows is that while stop and frisk was going up year after year, the number of guns that were collected as a result of the stop almost stayed the same. So you have, you know, 604 guns in 2002 when there were about 100,000 stops. And then there's 780 guns in 2011 when there's 700,000 stops, right? 
clearly this is not how you get guns off the street. We were even able to show that like with gun buyback programs in certain communities, they were able to get 300, 400 guns off the street in one night by doing programs like that. And so we started to debunk that in that. The other thing is the, you know, I'm, I'm saving black lives, right? This is why we're doing this practice. Despite the fact that stop and frisk was going up, shootings remained pretty much constant. What we found out is that shooting incidences were almost, um, it was almost a cycle. It happened the same way every year. They go up in the summertime, they go down in the winter. It's just the way that communities work, and it had nothing to do with stop and frisk. And so that was a lot of work for us to prove that you're not stopping the shootings by stop and frisk. Your people are still getting shot, and if anything, even though the murder rate was going down is because EMT service was getting better. Medical um, care was getting better. So people were still getting shot, they just weren't dying. It had nothing to do with Bloomberg and his policies. And so all this work we did to get to the vote. And so we had those two bills, the bill that created the IG, the bill that banned profiling, and we, we, if we put it up for a vote, it was a lot of work to get um, a super majority, and so in New York City, we knew Bloomberg would veto the legislation if it passed. And so in New York City, we have 51 council members, and so we needed 34 votes. Um, and we secured all 34 before we even took it for a vote. I mean, there were nights where we were up till midnight <laughs> talking to council members saying, like, just please do this vote, right? This is important for our, our communities. And we passed, we passed the bill. Obviously, the next day, Bloomberg vetoed it. Um, and so we had two months to get our act together and make sure that the people, the 34 votes that we had, stayed strong, they didn't change their mind, and they didn't get bought out, and it was tough. We had council members being promised all types of things from the other side. Uh, the police union started to go on the attack for some of our more progressive council members in their districts where they had more conservative members and saying that they are the reason why communities are safe, um, unsafe, and that criminals are gonna run loose. And so it took a lot of work, but we repacked the legislation, um, we overrode the veto, and yay, success. <laughs> um, but obviously, there are a lot, there's a lot more work to do. We still have those other pieces of legislation that we're trying to pass. We're still building up our capacity to hold police accountable. We, we started three new cop watch teams. We're doing a lot, of, a lot more work, and it's not over. So when we say we changed the NYPD, we changed some pieces of it. Um, and for advocates in New York who've been trying to um, reform police work for 20, 30, 40 years, this was the first time we actually saw some serious victories, and we did it as a group, we did it together. And I think that was, was what was most meaningful about the, what we did. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done. We're still meeting, I'm actually missing a meeting tomorrow um, with community groups where we're talking about our next phases in our, in our policy strategy to pass the rest of these bills this year. That's it. I feel like I was going to go